السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وبعد Welcome to uh, another session last of uh, the 12 week series on studying the pandemic uh, through framework of a maqasid uh, perspective today's session uh, is an open discussion uh, and uh, we proposing we started the discussion on tuesday and we proposing today to um, continue that and one of the two question we're posing here one of them is saying no going back life in the new pandemic era which explore our imagination on how uh, this new pandemic climate will be in all sectors of life the second question that we also started discussion on tuesday is the question of what is the future of maqasid and we did some good uh, uh, conversation on tuesday those who missed it you can go back go back to the video and listen to it but uh, we wanted to continue uh, thinking uh, uh, through what's the next step i wanted to before we open the floor um uh, i wanted to uh, recognize and uh, the contribution uh, i did uh, some of that last week uh, or that is on tuesday I, i recognized our contributors but i omitted to add some names and uh, this uh, 12 weeks uh, series was um, um, uh, a a group effort uh, by many some uh, belong to the committee that put together the series um, uh, chief of those are brother Muhammad bin Yemeni who uh, uh, get the credit for um, uh, working on the vision mission and keeping us all long uh, close and faithful to it um, brother Hisham also was in the committee sister al Hajja was in the committee Uh, Sister Zainab uh, Al-Qadiri and the other uh, Zainab Al-Qadiri and Zainab Burka uh, were helping us in the technical support. Uh, Zainab Al-Qadiri um, was sending the uh, weekly uh, emails, uh, was setting up the, um, uh, the Zoom. Uh, Zainab Burka um, was uh, doing the weekly upload on YouTube. Um, um, and uh, then we have our guest, Dr. Ahmed Raisouni, Dr. Jasir Ouda, Brother Khayyid Saad. Um, uh, among the contributors, we had also Dr. Uh, regular contributor, Mustafa Qandouz, um, Dr. Yasser Ghanem, uh, who was one of the speakers, Dr. Nazir Khan, um, Brother Suhaib Ramzan from UK. Um, uh, also among the contributors, Maryam Berka, Yassin Berka, uh, Sheikh Navid also made a contribution uh, on the on this series uh, to, uh, of of uh, response, um, uh, religious response. Uh, is this adab or is this uh, a punishment or is this uh, a trial? Uh, the, uh, Dr. Mahdi Qasqas uh, spoke to us about the uh, psychological um, aspects um, um, of uh, the pandemic and uh, he talked about individual versus uh, group uh, intervention. Uh, Dr. Shahid Al-Hassan came to us from Morocco, professor of uh, uh, um, Usul and uh, Maqasid and uh, He uh, made a contribution also. Brother Waqar also was, um, although he came later on in the series, but he's been since uh, regular with us and contributing at time. And uh, of course, uh, we can't forget Dr. Uh, Mustafa Abdul Wahid, who was a regular with us in the series, and he uh, um, always uh, um, questioned um, um, the use of maqasid in, 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 uh, in our times. Um, uh, other people have intervened. Uh, I just try to capture those who are more regular. And if I forgot somebody, please let me know, and we'll add it to the list here. Um, so, so uh, uh, just to give uh, credit uh, where it's due, 
um, um, as I forgot some people last week. For those who just joined us, uh, this are, uh, to, to this session is an open session um, to, to talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, and uh, just to guide the conversation, we proposed a couple of uh, uh, questions there. Um, uh, that is, how can we imagine um, uh, the life in the new pandemic era and the future of Maqasid? With that, I'll uh, stop here. We open it to the, to the floor for uh, your comments, discussions, and, and questions, etc. It is interesting that um, just um, about an hour ago, I was uh, on LinkedIn, and uh, a similar question to one was asked to Simon Sinek. And yeah. he had a very interesting uh, response. He says, uh, we cannot... Um, do away with the offices completely. It's not possible. It's a lot more work, um, primarily because we are tribal creatures. So we like to interact with other people to brainstorm. We like to, uh, you know, interact face to face, uh, you know, like putting uh, ideas on the whiteboard and erasing and writing notes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it will probably not. The office is probably not yet out. It won't ever be out. It's just that it'll be more of an open scenario where people are free to work from home or work from office uh, indefinitely. And whenever they want to be in the office to meet with people and interact and things like that, they can go to work. And uh, so there'll be a lot less um, uh, real estate used for office space, for sure. But uh, uh, probably in one building, there'll be multiple companies instead of one company per building sometimes. Um, so I, I kind of agree with that because we do need to interact with other people to, you know, uh, have that energy because you can't have that energy over Zoom or team or anything. We, you have to have it in a, you know, in person when multiple people are working towards the same idea or same outcome. And, uh, you have a certain energy there and it, it's what we call the mastermind alliance. When you have the mastermind alliance, then it's like all the brains of all the people are working as one and the outcome is better and quicker um, and agreeable to everybody. So I tend to agree with that point of view. So uh, good point, uh, Waqar. So you, you're addressing it from the perspective of how best business can operate um, to be in, in, in the interaction required, the physical interaction required for business. Uh, but, but we have to be reminded that the reason why this question is posed now is that we have a dilemma on how to manage the pandemic uh, while uh, trying to open uh, business. And we've talked um, in few scenarios during this series. A few weeks ago, um, um, and so so uh, point is, can we um, uh, bring back that physical interaction in offices without negatively impacting uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic and having spike again of infection requiring close down, which then we really defeating and, and bring us back to square zero. A few weeks ago, researchers uh, at the Imperial College of London, they, uh, they proposed a way of doing this. That is, how do we re, uh, um, uh, work with, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, trying to have some form of, uh, how do we gauge when we go forward, when we come back? Um, um, and, and one of the... Uh, 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 metrics that they used is um, um, uh, the um, uh, intensive uh, uh, care unit uh, spikes. That is uh, when you start seeing um, uh, waves of people, just like happened in Italy, uh, happened in New York City. Um, thank God, it, uh, you, know, you know, it didn't happen in, in many places because people were proactive and took measures. Uh, but how do we make this as a science where we are trying to cater, in, to cater for those business needs, but at the same time, 
uh, we have some way to know when to open the gauge and when to close the gauge. And, and Cuomo, uh, Governor Cuomo from New York, was was um, using this kind of gauge language. Uh, the uh, Imperial College London, in this figure here, proposed that the periodical votes of social distancing uh, to keep the pandemic at check while we're doing what we need to do with the economy, with the school reopening and, and other sectors with sports facilities and all that. And so the orange uh, line is the ICU admission. Uh, so that ICU admission could be high or it could be kept low. Uh, each time the, they rise above a threshold, say for example, 100 per week, as an example, uh, the country would uh, close all schools uh, and most universities uh, will adopt social distancing uh, in that situation. Um, so when they drop, say, below 50, those measures would be lifted, but people uh, with symptoms or, or whose family members have symptoms would still be confined at home. Um, so, so, but, but this actually raised another question, what, uh, what counts as social distancing? Because we keep talking about uh, practicing social distancing, and, and that itself, it's not clear. So I just wanted to uh, put us in context as we are saying what's best for, uh, uh, for the economy and for the business and that interaction, that physical, uh, the, which is actually more important also for schools. Uh, and universities, the people pay big top money so they can have that physical interaction. So I want us just to, uh, not to, to keep those uh, in play because that's really what we're talking about is the, is the COVID-19 era. I, <clears throat> I think that's a very interesting point you brought up. If I may put my um, analyst hat on, I'm a data analyst. So um, before we can come to a solution, uh, or propose a solution, I think it's important to know what are the parameters that we are actually um, assuming about and what is the data we have on hand. And uh, Dr. Perka, I think you have, as a medical personnel, you have a lot more data than I do. Um, but I, I, if I'm not wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a lot of um, unanswered questions there's a lot of uh, variation of uh, reports as to what we need to do. And a lot of different countries are reporting different results. And so we don't really have the right data in terms of how to deal with the pandemic or what is the virus capable of. In some cases, it's not showing um, a lot of fevers. In some cases, it's showing fever. Like I was just watching an interview with um, uh, uh, Dr. Fauci and um, uh, Rand Paul, I think. Um, and Rand Paul was showing data from different countries where they opened the school and, and the kids had no, they were not, uh, asymptomatic and they were not spreading according to the data from different countries, including in Europe and other places. And he was questioning Dr. Fauci, why don't you open the, open the schools and that why are you giving blanket statements without proper data without proper proof of what you're, uh, what you're backing your arguments on. So uh, whatever that is, that's aside from that. But my point is, I think we need to have the right information as just like you said, what does social distancing really mean? How do we define that, right? So what, light, what kind of uh, uh, precautions we need to take? Is just the face mask is enough or do we need to wear a whole suit what is it you know and uh, how do you evaluate which person might be at risk and he's coming to the office to create more risk you know some people are showing that their temperatures go up others are showing their temperatures are normal but they're still infected so we don't have a solid matrix to go with yeah so and, and, and that's I gave this as an example not as the all um, mm -hmm. I understand but this is one of the uh, scientific metrics uh, that came from London. Um, uh, Baha, you have a comment there? Yes, um, I, I just wanted to say actually, so, so these are um, the steps and the procedures that we're dealing with now because of the pandemic being um, going on. 
And so the opportunity that happened with this is that um, corporations or companies have realized that there are ways on actually saving their, their costs and maybe in, in some cases working more efficiently if they, um, if they do the um, programs like the working from home or, or remote um, meetings, collaboration online and, and all of that. And, and that's just got identified. So after the pandemic is, is gone and inshallah, I and mean, hopefully this happens soon, uh, who knows, but, but yeah, I think the question we will go back to is that the lessons that, that we learned from, uh, from the pandemic, uh, so when it comes to businesses, they would look at the maximizing, I think, they will get to a maximizing of um, remote working and less in, in office kind of um, um, work, um, uh, working time. At, at the same time, actually, with, with this pandemic, we, we realize, and I think this is obvious, that the a, a global or a bigger collaboration is is important to be to be in place so that we can face something like this. Because, I mean, the WHO had been, you know, warning the world for years about the the, the next biggest problem would be a virus or, or a pandemic, like like what exactly happened, and that that would put um, economy, lives, and, you know, um, social life, and all of that in, in jeopardy, and, and they, they want to be prepared for it. And this is where my question comes, is that if we think that something like this would happen, and they were almost certain that it would happen, like, how do you get prepared for it? Because you don't know how to be prepared for this, other than being um, diversified in economy, having putting programs in, in place for um, like social programs for, for the people and the citizens of, of the countries and how, how to deal with it. Um, but yeah, I think there are these lessons that, that we learned from this pandemic and that's where we were going back. We will not go back to uh, full life like it was um, when it comes to economy and all of that. The biggest issue with this, and I, I'm not sure like how to tie these two together between the energy and the and the climate like being responsible on on the climate change is is, is one thing and you know um, getting energy for um, civilization to continue to grow is, is another thing and how we will be able to um, balance these two, two together if anyone has any you know input on that yeah, that's a whole uh, other scenario to uh, wrap uh, um, our head around. Mohammed, uh, did you want to tackle uh, this question and also do your comment? You you were asking to comment. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, <clears throat> um, thank you, brother Wakar and uh, brother Ba. Um, uh, I I think uh, just uh, the 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 question when it comes to uh, to this. Um, returning uh, back and economy and, and maybe economical factor when the uh, link it with the numbers, it, 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 it already start to be questionable. It's like they were even starting questioning uh, if, are we, if we are returning back, how far we are getting importance to the level we communicate with each other. And uh, we, it, it shows that companies that they have more channels of communication and more more synchronicity or synchronicity in 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 in, in terms of wave uh, of communication between people they get uh, they keep themselves aligned around strategy and st studies that we, uh, we, we we presented 3 4 weeks ago which showed that people in this covid even if they are uh, making some economy in terms of um, um, uh, space and going work and so on, they are losing the, the, the side of um, alignment, uh, excitement, um, um, and, and, and connectivity with others and connectivity with the concept that is um, kind of gathering people. Now, when it comes to the environment, which is really uh, triggering uh, thinking here, because a lot of, uh, one of the studies, at least, that I, 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 I was reading at one point, they were triggering the environment is one of the victims in this COVID-19. Why? Because people now, and even the countries, 
they become less globalized because they start thinking about themselves. And then they become less aligned about the big goals and they become uh, giving more priority to the, to the issue. They are even spending more than World War uh, Second. It's like that's that's how how you can how you can imagine now countries they are giving the priorities to these issues of uncertainty and this is where I it comes to my comment but just just by looking at it they are neglecting the sustainability questions the environmental questions uh, and now without the crisis of the racism they will be even neglected this is why we saw in many in many places the right the human right it gets a little bit neglected and this is this is a factor that this is we need just to i think we need to mind it while we are looking at the pandemic and how uh, how we want the healing part if we were, if we are about to bring in it back to the society um, and how it's related to those big questions um coming coming back to my comment and this is this is one 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 of the issues that uh, uh maybe uh that's that diagram that dr nordin showed in the beginning because of the lack of uh, certainty and because of volatility and complexity of the situation what they did is they track it empirically they didn't track it in terms of measurement and kind of uh, forecast and I can tell you what will happen. No, they are keeping it as part of uh, uh, as part of the empirical data that come from the ground and then that data from the ground will adjust as input. And it's like this this uh, balancing loop as the as they call it in system thinking. And why? It's it's just because of this. Uh, within, within now even they are developing those uh, new new acronyms. Uh, VOCA, it's a V U C A, uh, comes for vulnerability, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. For example, it comes with this pandemic because it comes at the level that we are so uncertain. So uh, the, the data is even so volatile. What makes sense yesterday doesn't make a lot of sense maybe in some other areas tomorrow and so on. And they keep questioning what, how they are dealing with data, what are the, the main factors to deal with it. There are some level of agreement, no, no doubt about that. Uh, there are also the, the, the another acronym that came in my head that um, um, it, 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 was, it was an article of Harvard that they were kind of uh, uh, publishing that one. It was uh, two nice, turbulent, uncertainty, um, uh, novel and ambiguous, something like that. It's like it's something that doesn't, that, that need to deal with our level of dealing with uncertainty. And what does it mean in terms of dealing with the pandemic? That means that we, we are not able to learn from our experience. This is what does mean, because we have a lot of experiences as a human being. We have even these pandemics happen and happen, but the analogy with the past lost the meaning uh, because we cannot project it in the future, because the situation, because the complexity, because the world is a little bit different structure in it. And then when situation, they said, when situation like analogies to the past, it's hard to envision the future. And this is, this is we, need, we need to admit this type of level of ambiguity. Uh, because, because what will help us to deal with, it will help us to learn from the future, not rely on the past. Now all the diagrams and, 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 the, and the prevision, it comes to make sense from the data in order to learn from the past. But there are some fields that are opening, how we can learn from the future by opening those, um, cage uh, uh, or opening those 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 uh, doors uh, to to this level dealing with this level of uh, vulnerability and dealing with this level of uncertainty and so on just i want to bring this one because it's it help us to deal what is what is the essence of this change uh, human being already did with um, uh, the town or other pandemics in the past but uh, the uh, it was not kind of questioning uh, the level how they did with the information because the information was not guiding the society. Now, everything is, is so complex that you cannot 
the envision your future as economy, envision your future as human relationship, envision your future as learning system, envision your future as as a kind of agile kind of economy and agile business model and so on. That we need just to mind that. That's I don't want to elaborate more, but uh, I want just to bring the attention to this. Thanks. So, uh, uh, Hisham, uh, go ahead. Could you could you guys come on the video because it seems like I'm looking at myself and nobody uh, is visible. <laughs> um, come on the video if you can, uh, so we could see you talking and we could interact. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So much. Well, that's better. Now I'm talking to a, roo a room full of people. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other point I want to bring is the concept of science, uh, because I saw uh, I saw yesterday uh, not an interview but a reaction from uh, the governor of Florida, for example. He was mocking Dr. Fauci and other specialists of because they said if you open too early, you gonna you gonna be in trouble. And now after what I think they said uh, uh, they said that they, they said a uh, projection for two weeks or three weeks. After eight weeks, there was nothing happening in his state. They were saying, "Look, you tell me, you told me two weeks, three weeks. I'm eight weeks now, and I'm okay." But after after the eight weeks, it started to happen. Then so the concept of science in the head of people is um, is this science that is accurate? Uh, you know, it's it's so simple. If its prediction is like this, you'll be like this. So people are when they hear about it, or they print it for a specialist, they want to see it the way they see it. But we know this: this is a new, 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 a new virus. You know, people are still, uh, you know, guessing sometimes. I don't know if the message for the scientists should be more humble and saying to people, "Hey, we don't know, but we don't know. We just know this much." Uh, and this is we're we'll making predictions, and the predictions are not science. Predictions are just predictions. Uh, we are guessing real, okay? And I think that's the or some you know the the lack of trust of people uh, on this what's called science. Because as I said, a governor that's supposed to be uh, educated and on stuff, he was he was mocking the scientist community for uh, miss, missing the prediction and saying after eight weeks nothing happening. You guys know, don't know nothing and all stuff. And even with the interview that uh, the brother mentioned uh, with Dr. Fauci, people are attacking him. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, they're attacking his credibility. They're attacking her for whatever reason, political reason or economic reason, whatever that is. And you can see here that even the concept that we were still believing in are under attack. And I don't know where we're going for with this. Um. Yeah, the governor of Florida now is paying the price for that kind of stupid uh, thinking. Um, the numbers are are going crazy in in Florida right now. Um, so so I mean he he was in a different world uh, for for a while. Um, I'm not clear, Hisham. Uh, what is the message you're making as far as the um, uh, so, accuracy so of the scientists? Because yeah. scientists you know, work with the the data in hand and the data are changing all the time, right? And so that's the exactly. so that's the point that, that brother brought. So right now we have this uncertainty. The science is not giving us all the answer we want right away. So I think as as a as a normal citizen, we should be able to look at this complexity, understand this complexity, and make sure that we will not get our answer quickly. But if a specialist tell you to make a mask, even he's wrong, I think it's better to, uh, at least for, for a while, I think it, it's cautious to, you know, go with the flow, respect, uh, you know, the respected opinion. And after that, you can see, yeah, the prediction was wrong. Maybe we should not work. Okay. But I think right now we are just, it's like it's happening even in our community uh, in the religious matter. If someone, if somebody make a you know an opinion a legal opinion everybody's become a sheikh and everybody saying no uh, you know uh, maybe it's not this it's not that it's not this it's not that and this environment nobody's making any <laughs> nobody is able to make any any decision at the end and you also, just so you cannot always blame the people when they see nonsense coming from the mashaykh so we have to 
keep the right as citizens, as non-scholars, to question uh, fatwa. When, when you have a scholar who's telling you, no, we should not stop the Juma, well, <laughs> you don't need to be... Uh, so, here what, I, what I'm trying to say is these boundaries that you're talking about. Sometimes even the scientists are saying something that doesn't make sense. The yeah. people are looking at it and say, oh, it does not make sense. Why am I following it, right? And with the name of science, people are, are trying to um, push you to, you know, to believe stuff. And you say, no, it doesn't make sense. As you just said, fatwa, that is clearly it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It does, doesn't matter who's seeing it, where, where from coming from it. But in the same times, if you denying everything and pushing back everything and, you know, saying no to everything, we're going to be on the other side, on the, on the opposite side. So I think this mindset that can, can jackal this too, I believe that's what we have. And that's what we don't have right now. We have people that they don't care or people that blindly follow things without even thinking. I think Baha has a follow-up or comment on this. Yes, I actually, I want to build on, on Hisham's um, point there because we have, we have seen it in, in every aspect of life where there are deniers to the, to the facts, to the, to the science. And I don't know, is this, is this because something is more um, appealing to them than, than the actual numbers or not? We still, in the 21st century, we still get like presidents of like the United States who doesn't believe in global you know, warming or, or the, um, the change in, 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 the, um, um, in, the, in the weather. Um, we still have, have seen a lot, a lot of people today, like in 21st century, in the year 2020, still don't believe that the cancer is, is, an, actual, is an actual thing that, that happens and they think that it's just a conspiracy. Same, same thing when, when, when the, this pandemic, when the COVID-19, um, had started until today. There are still people who believe that that this is just a scam, um, you know, to get to get uh, to get some people um, enriched and and you know and to control the world and all of that. So, so this to to Ishan's point, like like this is there and it's been always always there. It's it's just like so for for the common people, how how do you how do you get them to to um, how to say that, to be confident with the numbers that they get presented with. How, how do they um, be, um, you know, assured that, that these are the numbers? I mean, the projection for the future is just a projection for the future. It, like any, for any reason, it can, can change. It's, it's to the best that we can today, based on the, the data and the information that we have today, that we can go so, so much or so far in, in predicting what's going to happen. Right, but but it's it's a mentality of the people or the non-believers, call them of of science, and how do you get them um, on board for for things like this so that that they can be responsible enough not to cause any any issues? I mean, we have we have seen it in in different places in the world. There was <clears throat> so, for example, I would say like in in Jordan or in Palestine, even um, in Palestine, for example, for Sometimes they, they reacted very well to the, to the pandemic, saying, well, yeah, these cities will be closed, no movement, uh, make sure that, you know, you don't, you don't um, contact any, any other people. And then it's one day when they left, when they left this up, then, yeah, you, you, you see the cases just rise through the roof. And that's, and that's basically the point, is that people still don't have that confidence in, in their governments or in, in the science that they hear about. And we, we talked, by the way, I just wanted to interject a, um, a ground uh, um, rule. Uh, I know we posed uh, two possible discussion points. There is the uh, pandemic era and the future of Maqasid. With your permission, I wanted to, uh, for us to continue talking about this and then come back and talk a little bit of, on the Maqasid. This way we don't go back and forth and get confused a little bit there. Uh, we, we did talk in one of the sessions on a framework, an ethical framework of reopening. And uh, uh, we've uh, reviewed the Canadian, uh, the published Canadian uh, ethical framework. Because the question is, how do you get the people to trust the government, to trust the scientists? 
Uh, you do that by having a transparency, you do that by having a, a, an ethical framework, you, and that doesn't happen during the COVID-19. This happened in the political system that you have in place already. In countries like ours, where autocratic countries, the government decides something and they send the police and the military to enforce it. And, uh, uh, and of course, the citizen, because they're not convinced, they're going to play around those, right? They're going to have the mask right here on their neck. When they see the police, they put it up. But really, in the dark alleys, they're just doing what they have to do. So, so we, we did talk about this actually more than once, that, uh, that, that, that uh, what the people, how they view their governors their, 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 uh, and, and, their, and their government is very important in their compliance. And, and uh, I think overall, if you compare U.S. and Canada, in, the U, in, in Canada, the lead for the instruction was the healthcare um, authorities, not the politician. The politician come just to, uh, in, in, in the back of those announcements. And they always say that, well, we're waiting for whoever, each province have their known person who brief. Uh, in the U.S., uh, Fauci is, uh, is a lone warrior there uh, with the lady next to him. And then you have governments, governors doing their own thing. Mohammed, do you want to come back to some discussion? Uh, yeah, sure. Is, is, that, is that this point that um, we, we're bringing here? And we, uh, one, one of the opening or entry point to, to tackle it is to bring the ethical framework. That's one thing. Uh, but more broadly, and this is how, how it was kind of even uh, discussed in one of the interviews uh, about, about the situation, is like the pandemic due to this vulnerability that science is suffering from and due to this uncertainty that we are dealing with and due to this confusion of authority with tyranny. It's like even the scientists deplete as a tyranny process here. And we want just to, to mind that. We need to mind and, and, the, and, and to mind this, this, this role, confusion of roles that they can play. People deplete it when there is a room for it. And uh, what, what is the big, the, the big component here? Is just to bring the human being aspect. You are dealing with human being. If they lose trust, if they lose confusion, if they feel manipulated, they will play it against the system even if you have the right data. And it's not about data anymore. And what does it mean trust? That means when you know what you don't know, you see it and you deal with it in terms of some more transparency. And this is one thing. The second thing is to talk more. And Canada, it's not the healthcare, at least from my perspective, as play around. The healthcare, we, they don't talk to us. What talk to us is Justin, when he gets out from his uh, whatever room, whatever, and they start talking with the people with their language when he's denying his authority as government and coming as as um, as um, uh, kind of uh, compassion with the people. We with you and we are dealing with the situation. We are playing with the number. We are out of whatever resource. We are. We are. We are. We are. And we feel it's like there is some analysis based on his discourse and how it's related to bring the trust how it's related to bring people to, at least, at one point they are trying to play it in collaboratively. And that's, that's a big issue. It's like when, when you remove the human component from this paysage or from this, uh, from this big picture, you, you remove the collaboration, you remove the coordination, you remove the people to, to do their role. I know that there is some doubt here. And, uh, what I need to do. Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can. I know that you're not sure 100% that I need to put a mask, but at least I see your perspective. Let me just play it this way. And this is we need to learn from that because the situation of pandemic by system, it brings the rule and the authority because there is a room for it. And because there is, we are not aware about it. If we bring our awareness and the long term, this is New Zealand kind of model. 
if we bring this awareness in the long term, what we need to do, we need to do the opposite. It's not playing it authority here. It's not playing it the tyranny and order and so on. Play it different angle, because this is where you can win. The, 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 it's like the, this is infinite game <laughs> at one point, because as long as you play it back and forth, it doesn't end. And it go back and forth, it go back and forth. And it's like, you need to make it um, kind of uh, digestible for people. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, can we hear also from Omar, from al Hajja, from uh, Qandouz, from uh, Maryam, from Yasin, from Zineb? Um, um, you were part, active part of this uh, series, uh, just to hear different perspective um, as you think through this. As you're thinking, um, one of the uh, solution that somebody may, may say, who's worried about opening business, they may say, well, if the problem is ICU bad, because that's really where the button neck is, right? Because you could deal with people infected and, uh, and, you know, and, 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 and all things. But when you get people are dying in waves, just like what happened when we saw in certain places where they're actually burying people in, in masses. That's a scary sight. What if we say, okay, every country build as many uh, ICU beds as possible, massive facilities to counter all possible uh, spikes of the infection. Would that work? Um, the researchers actually thought about this uh, model. Uh, you know, in the U.S., they did a lot of preparation in certain states. They were trying to be proactive. They're looking at the wave coming from the east. You know, they saw what happened in China and Europe, and they prepared. And so when, with that preparation, when they didn't have a big hit on ICU, the denier of the pandemic said, see, this was just over uh, scare. And what are we going to do with all this equipment? What are we going to do with all these beds and all that? Uh, but uh, uh, scientists who did modeling, they, uh, they looked at this question of having enough uh, beds for ICU. And they say that, that that will not solve the problem. Without social distancing of the whole population, they found even the best mitigation strategy, which means isolation uh, or quarantine for the sick, the old, and, and, and those who have been exposed uh, plus school closures would still lead to a surge of critically ill people eight times bigger than the US or UK system can cope with. Um, I have a figure here that uh, from that same imperial study uh, where they're showing, see they, 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 that, that the, in this figure here, when you look at the, the lowest blue curve there um, uh, in this graph, the, the, uh, the flat red line is the current number of ICU beds, that one in the bottom, that flat line. Um, uh, so even if you set factories to steer out beds and ventilators and do big production of those and all the other facilities and supplies, you will still need far more nurses and doctors to take care of everyone. And so this modeling is showing that this solution of saying, hey, let's just have enough ICU beds and then we'll be uh, going back to, anytime somebody gets sick, we'll just, we have enough bed to send them. That's not going to work according to this modeling. I was just entertaining you guys until some, oh, Yasin is writing something. Yasin, could you come to the mic and actually say it? Right, so I'm just I'm just reading. Uh, so now I'm just reading what I wrote in the in the group chat, um, in response to the request for comments. I'm not sure, honestly, uh, with regard to solutions. Um, among the biggest COVID-19 national crises are those of Brazil and the United States. Um, the heads of state, politicians, and corporations of both of those nations have made clear they either prioritize the bottom line, capitalism that is above all, or or they outright buy into denial or pseudoscience in regard to the crisis and the virus itself. I'm not sure what the answers are, or where do you even begin when your when your rulers, when your government doesn't even care. So my answer is I'm not sure, honestly. So uh, he, you see, in, uh, part of the conversation we had is the idea of um, political involvement of the citizen. 
Um, can you um, imagine or think of ways, um, I, I, oh, and this is just one form of involvement, the political involvement and engagement, that is, that's the word. Uh, what do you think about that? I, th I think your ability to, um, to engage as an, as an individual citizen um, when, you're, when you don't even have the support of your government is, is very limited. Um, uh, that is, it's, it's limited along the lines of class. What, what do you do when, when your government is not providing financial support for those out of work? What do you do if, you're, if, your state, if your state or province has reopened and you're working class and you have no choice but to go back to work and risk your life every day to feed yourself? You, you can't, you don't, have to, you don't have the time or the resources to, uh, to object because you either, you're either working or you starve because your government is, is not interested in, in keeping things closed and, and providing for its citizens instead of injecting trillions of dollars into the stock markets. Okay. Um, brother uh, Mustafa Kanduz. Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Um, there is actually a lot to unpack in, in all of this. So um, I'm just going to try um, comment on the on the main question. That's um, can we go back to normal or are we going to go back to normal? Those are two different questions. Um, without falling in, into uh, wishful thinking, I think there is probably nothing major that will change. Um, even then the so-called Spanish flu pandemic, which killed, as you know, tens of millions. Uh, other, I mean, okay, there were geopolitical changes. There were um, fluctuations in um, um, uh, births and, and, and stuff like that. But uh, in essence, the way human beings were evolving or were moving socially um, is not is unlikely to be changed that much. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I can't. I'm not. I don't have a. <laughs> uh, I'm not a predictor or anything. But I'm just thinking. The the real question would be not to ask what's going to change, but what uh, what must we change. And what to, must uh, social uh, reformers um, or social reform movements uh, focus on for in the next um, period? And one thing, one major thing that all this crisis has shown is that there is a problem with. Okay, we we talk about the infrastructure, the the health infrastructure, the economic infrastructure inequalities, all of that. That has that has shown its failures and its shortcomings. But there is a major and even more important, in my opinion, infrastructure that needs to be uh, reworked. It's the cognitive, intellectual uh, uh, infrastructure. What, what's, how people are thinking, because you, you have, must have noticed that lately, all with, and you talked about this in, at length in the, in the series, uh, the, the, how much fake news, denial, um, all that stuff that's, uh, that's spreading and that's really crippling the, uh, even the basic uh, measures that some states are trying to take. Masks gain symbolic uh, uh, meaning while they should just be a, a very simple measure. Um, Stuff like that. So where does that all come from? It comes from uh, problems with the with our cognitive um, uh, uh, training or cognitive education. So there is a lot to do in uh, in opening the minds of people. In in other words, so I think any social reform, social uh, change, um, should focus on that aspect or in the, in the knowledge aspect. And particularly in 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 uh, uh, third world countries, for example, where where it's really easy now to manipulate people or to 
just um, uh, by, by spreading false information, WhatsApp or uh, Facebook or any, any other. So, so that I think that should be the focus in the next in the next period to focus on re working, re uh, reforming the cognitive um, uh, stru structure or cognitive uh, 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 framework in, in the minds or, uh, of people. In uh, just basically teaching, reteaching re them the basics of common sense and how to define, how to uh, recognize what's truth and what's not. In other words, to to restore the authority of truth and uh, how to get it. So that's what I'm going to say. If it makes sense. Baha is commenting critical thinking. Yes, and, yeah. and this is to, um, yeah, this, this is exactly the, the point. This is what we want to, to work on is to change the culture by introducing critical thinking to, to people and how you know they can evaluate what they are for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. By the way, everybody, uh, any aspect of the discussion today is open and we're not restricted to the pandemic. We have the other question also, the future of Maqasid. Um, 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 and today we're not uh, directing too much the conversation. We just and I think we can, we can link this to this Maqasid framework that we were talking about, uh, Nodar Din, I believe. Because that will help you to, um, to think, to have, a, to have a methodology of thinking. And I think that's what... Uh, uh, Mustafa is alluding to that. Have the aql. Have the aql exactly. With yeah. aql, with 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 giving people tools to uh, start thinking through, but it's not simplistic. And I think that's uh, that's why we're talking about along this. It's not a simplistic methodology that will allow you to uh, uh, drive through or uh, pilot through this uh, this huge uh, complicated issues. Uh, we started with uh, with COVID nineteen, uh, you know, a pandemic, and we know now when you touch one one aspect of healthcare, you touch an aspect of politics, you touch aspect of economy, you touch aspect of soci society, you touch aspect of religion. It's a complex situation, and people are not used to this, and especially in our community, uh, we are used to simplistic ideas. You know, uh, you know, you get this. Uh, there's a sheikh that give you fatwa, you know, with one aspect of things without even looking at any other things, and people are are happy with that, and that will will lead to to disasters that we see now, uh, that people are not able to jug, you know, pilot through this a huge complexity in this world. Everything is linked together, and I believe maybe that's what the future of Makassar is uh, is uh, is one of the not a solution, but one of the tools that we can give our people and ourselves to start thinking through this uh, life uh, that is complicated now. Everything is linked, and uh, how how to get through that? But how? Well, I, I think on the future of of Maqasid, we we have to look at it at at um, different tiers. Let's let's call it. So, so with with Maqasid, and I really appreciate and I really thank you for. For the effort that you put for um, for this whole um, you know um, course, I guess, in 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 in, um, in trying to apply the mechanism to the COVID nineteen. But the way I looked at it, and from what I learned going going through with you in this in this journey, is that so one tier of of applying mechanism because mechanism can can actually do um, a lot. To, to us on, on a personal level. So if we start with this on, on a, a personal um, level where, you know, um, observing Makassid in our day-to-day -day decisions or our day-to-day -day, um, um, living, and then grow this a little bit bigger to uh, the community that, that we live in and how we can apply this within our community, neighborhood to a community, a bigger community, and then, um, up to the and then to the municipality, take it to the city, to to um, the higher the higher government until until you get to the to the biggest one or the the top 
the most top one, which is the, the government, to apply these and um, in the decision taking and, and how we approach things and, and livings of, of people in, in life. I think I think this is this is the way I, I look at Maqasid from um, from um, this perspective. And I, I, I'll give them um, the only thing or the only one that can, yeah. Now finish, finish your thought. Yeah. So, so my, my my point is that it's controllable on on our personal level. It's harder at at a higher level when it comes to to a government, which is even more more effective. But having this as becoming a culture and evaluating our day to day needs and our day to day um, operations, I think is is very uh, very beneficial. And and I'm going to give Mohammed the chance to comment also. But uh, I wanted to also in the rest of the time in this open uh, conversation to hear because we're not going to get another chance to get that. We may do we may commission a survey uh, for a feedback on the on the series. Uh, but uh, we'd like to hear it also from you guys uh, at the personal level. How did you uh, conceive this uh, series, um, uh, both from the pandemic side of the discussion and the maqasid and the integration? And I think you've you've started the, to touch uh, base on that, uh, Baha. Mohammed. Uh, my comment is what I mean. What you can learn from this uh, from this uh, pandemic? What's I mean for me? What to how we can move forward and how we can link it to Maqasid. I think the number one thing that we noticed, and I was surprised in the, um, in the US in the, in the 2001 uh, war in, against Iraq and Afghanistan, the US policy, the left and right, were all united against one enemy. And they don't like, uh, nobody is saying different opposing word. And although there was a lie, but still people were behind their government. Here I notice there's a war inside the country and there's a split of vision. There are special interests is the one dominating the, the policies. So imagine in the US, say, okay, we have, to, and that's what I hope in the future, put the red lines when it, there is an interest in the country, there's no like uh, special interests like uh, I'm working for this for the government trying to get elected or the other one to go after him because I want him to not to get elected. The priority is number one is how to move forward together because there's a common enemy to the country. And the maqasid we learn is that in al-amalu bin niyat. So niyat is very important and you have your niyat has to be straightforward that what's the purpose of niyat. And this issue we can learn from it not only and you can see that the consequence at the government level, live alone in our community, in our association, we can have the same problem. We can, if you put the, the special interest first, then you're going to have a lot of chaotic and a lot of chaos and a lot of problems. But if you put the interests of the, the country, for example, of the, or the enter of the mission of the, the why we are doing this or doing that, and we are all together when we see the, the, the common enemy, like we see it outside the country, then I think at least I will hope that we have it all the time and we have to think fair, uh, uh, fairly. But I, the thing for me to learn from this is anytime there is division because of special interests, Anytime we put a group interest on the top, then everything is going to be chaotic. And one of the major problems I noticed in this uh, era of uh, coronavirus is like, I, 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 some, sometimes I ask myself, if I was someone that is working like $10 a day, an hour, or $11 an hour, what I will do? And my thinking is, I would not care about coronavirus because I need to feed my family. Because these wealthy would never thought about me when they have I have problem of uh, uh, not having insurance. They would not care about me if I have some diseases. I cannot, for example, I have done uh, the. Uh, I mean, at NIH, we I have to take courses when it comes to like uh, health disparity, and I noticed how the African Americans and how Hispanic are suffering in when it comes to medical field. For example, if they go to a doctor in a hospital, they know because you don't have insurance or they know because you have not very good insurance, they don't ask you to do lots of tests. They just go, okay, they do the minimum of the minimum, and that's why they end up with a lot of uh, problems. The same way, I mean, if the person doesn't trust anymore the system because they see their special interests on the top of everything, then the loss is, is, everything is lost. But in the Makassi, the way I see it, you can learn from it is, 
The priority number one is uh, what you have is the, the community, to save the community, not yourself by itself. Because if each one think about the community, how to save it, he's going to save himself. But if each one think about himself or think about self-interest as a group of wealthy people, then we get this, the whole system going to fail. Hopefully, they're going to learn from data and sit together and say, we have to learn from the pandemic and we have to put red lines. Don't use... I mean, the, the interests of the country because of the interests of special group against another fighting for the election. And that's why, I mean, let's imagine we did, well, we're not in the year of election in the U.S. A lot of things would be different. Imagine we didn't have Trump as a president, was Obama, for example. A lot of things could be different because not there is no me in the equation. There's no, uh, like, uh, uh, I, I have uh, myself to put uh, myself as a priority. That's why Trump is different from the rest of the previous president because he sees himself the center of everything. And that's, that, that's what's destroyed, I mean, the, the, uh, a lot of things in this, uh, in this politics in the U.S. But, I mean, to conclude, I would hope that in the future they will sit down after the pandemic and think about special and as the, the interests of the country. There is red lines, you cannot use them to, to against each other. And for Islam, like I see, the perspective I see it is, when it comes to Maqasid, is there is the interest of the community on the top of the special interest. And once you have this in your mind, each one will be satisfied and happy that, okay, they think about me, I will think about everybody. But if nobody take care of me, I'm gonna end up, everyone be like selfish and gonna have a, a problem like we see now in around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Mohammed, bil Yemeni. Thank you, the other <laughs> uh, So, uh, just say, uh, uh, as I'm thinking, because it's uh, it's little bit a related uh, related topic, related topic from from many aspects, because there is a responsibility or the ethical or the level that you need to have as. Uh, as component there, and there is this cognitive that uh, Brother Mustafa brought in in perspective that need to be kind of has some level of reform and stuff, and uh, and there is this level of what is the revelation is aiming and how you can link yourself with the with the aim of revelation if you are Muslim and you know you want to be faithful and so on, uh, and there is this level that Baha is bringing. This is the practicality because it's not practical to the individual level in the level of day to day. So it's many components. Just I want I want to approach it from this perspective. Maqasid if it's coming and not multidisciplinary tackling the akhlaq and tackling the, 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 the what should be that. It's not only about decision-making process, it's also, also about the akhlaq. And uh, it's, if, if it's not kind of coming together, which maqasid are we talking about? And this is the limitation that we dealt with. If we are talking about maqasid that is more about conceptual level, and maybe disconnected from the context in terms of process or in terms of manifestation or in terms of tools or in terms of perspective, which maqasid are we talking about? And this is, this is the, 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 the issue. It's not about the title of the maqasid. There are maqasids, a lot of maqasids perspective that need to be cleaned up and you need, you need some lot of work to be done in order to make it a little bit operational, multidisciplinary, so it's, it's, it take, it's taking charge. When, when I hear Yassin saying, oh, what you can do when there is government is doing that and doing that, it's like oh, hopeless. This is, we, we are going to die. We are going facing the wall. If Maqasid is not incorporating how you can navigate when there is a complexity and when there is a lot of darkness and how you can see some lights in order to start tackling them, which Maqasid are we talking about? It's a it's, it's little bit questioning about the maqasid that we were talking about, bringing it to solve our pandemic, whatever kind of issue here. Uh, and, the, and, and it's linked. So if we are envisaging or if we are projecting or if we are aiming for some type of maqasid, we need this maqasid to come close to ourselves in our relationship with the, with the divine. It's not something for, all, for everybody and everything. It's like we need to envis uh, to, to, have, to have a scope, how we can frame it, how we can tackle it, how we can deal with it, how it can help us. And if it's not helping us, why we are talking about it in this vague way? It's like we are, we are self-deceiving ourselves. And this self-deception, it's not helpful. <laughs> 
so that's that's kind of critics about what we did, but in t- in the same time is self responsibility how we need to see ourselves as a Muslim. Ourselves as a Muslim, we are not segregating it as disciplines, as a human being. I'm not segregating myself how I feel and how I feel as a responsibility and how I rationalize in it as connective, um, cognitive kind of framework. It's me. If, if it, they are not synchronized, if they are not aligned, what, what, what Muhammad will be doing uh, in, in, in different direction? It's like we are not bringing the peace to oneself. We are bringing a little bit thought here and thought here, superficiality and so on and so on. So I'm just uh, bringing more, maybe more responsibility, maybe more, 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 more uh, rigorous to be talking about about uh, what we want uh, from this maqasid and what we want from this perspective of, of COVID-19. COVID-19 is expecting from us the way we think, the way we take responsibility, and the way we act. And with, with thinking without responsibility, it may deceive us at one point. So this is kind of multiple disciplinarity there, and we want to to bring them as as bottom line. So whoever starts talking about the issue, the concern as a human being, he can fail. What is the level of my responsibility there? And 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 that's I, I don't want to oversimplify in it in the Khawla's model. If if I may talk about it, I, I will write a book about Khawla one day. Anyway, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I'm just, I'm just uh, trying to, uh, to, to conceive it a little bit. Uh, just um, for the audience that may have missed those sure. uh, examples, you're referring to "Qad Sami Allah wa Qawla Allati Tujadiluka Fi Zawjiya." So that's that's my 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 my, my two cents here. Um, uh, we know that the Islam is is giving us a mission, and we want to be. Uh, faithful to this mission. We don't want to oversimplify stuff, otherwise we are not helping us to be more practical. And what makes us specific, t- taking this action and not taking this action, in cognitive way, in responsibility way, and the, the, the type of behavior that I want to tackle. It's, uh, we need to bring the specificity there. If we are losing the specificity and we still keeping the generic message, the generic wording, the generic kind of, uh, Overall, uh, I think I think uh, Makassi didn't bring much to us. I mean, um, I'm gonna give a chance to Baha. <clears throat> yes, to Brother Muhammad uh, Yemeni. Just wanted to to say about about the Makassi, and it's not limited to us. It's not only the Muslims, right? So nations have put Makassi in their constitutions or in their in their policies, and they work towards it. What I like about about what we have here is that is that this would give us a good um, um, a plan really to create a system how to address problems like like if we look at the maqasid from from like the different aspects or the different uh, perspectives of of the maqasid and in dealing with the problems or the pandemics or the issues like the bigger issues that that we have in our community we would be able to to create a, a systematic way of approaching these these problems so that we can end up in a solution and once this is established and, and we basically created a methodology of how to use the maqasid in um in dealing with with the problems of the issues then it doesn't matter, um, and, and this is um, to um, our brother Muhammad uh, Burdi's point, and so if we create that kind of system or methodology, then really whoever is in the government, in the power, the political power, is irrelevant, because when it comes to the community and the group um, benefit, then we're, 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 in, we're applying this methodology that hopefully to a great extent, it will um, get us to the best solution that we can based on the selections of, of these methodologies. Isham. So I, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, build up on Muhammad's discussion. I, and I believe, uh, you know, I was thinking about this since we started this, uh, this uh, studies. 
I was linking it to the study we did in 2014. And I believe the solution of maqasid, we're talking here about maqasid sharia or maqasid sharia, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, we claim as Muslims that uh, uh, we can benefit the humanity from the wisdom of al-wahi. And I believe that's, that's, uh, that's what the maqasid is, not only maqasid by itself, because as Baha'i said, every nation has a maqasid thing, has a goal thing, has in their constitution and their things. So I, I, I believe uh, from these two studies we did, uh, this is what, this is the suggestion I'm putting forward. I believe for a maqasid to be, as Muhammad said, to be effective and to make solutions to people, you, st- you have to uh, have it as a philosophy first. Second, you have to have it as a methodology or a framework, so a tool, a real tool. And the third one, you have to try it. And I think that's where maybe uh, Horizon, Horizon Academy has a, has a, has a responsibility because you can take a tool and you can start uh, putting, putting it on, on the ground. And I think that's what we're missing. So I think we need these three levels because most people, when they talk about Malkasad, they part, I don't think so as a philosophy yet, as developed as a, as a, as a philosophy yet. But we were missing the methodology or the framework or the tool. And we're missing uh, that, you know, uh, trying it on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the ground level. And I think this, what we did in this series and trying to link Makassar to the, the pandemic, I think it was a good try. Uh, now, we didn't have the tool and we were just trying uh, our best from the beginning. But I believe uh, going forward, you need this three level. That um, uh, so the philosophy, the the methodology, and someone to to start uh, putting together on the field uh, of different field that we were were seeing uh, issues or trying to make a reform or trying to make a change. So I wanted to, as I just wanted to um, um, get back to the first question. Um, not uh, no going back life uh, in the new pandemic era and i want to share with you uh, a uh, an excerpt from an article i read today for, uh, written by somebody from mit uh, on the on the question he says we don't know exactly what this new future looks like of course but one can imagine a world in which to get a flight perhaps you will have to be signed up to a service that tracks your movement via your phone. The airline would not be able to see where you would gone, but it would get an alert if you would be close to a known infected uh, people or disease hotspots. There would be similar requirements at the entrance to large venues, government buildings, or public transport hubs. By the way, we already have here in the hospital for last uh, uh, almost two months, they screen us at the door when we come to the hospital. There will be uh, 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 temperature scanners everywhere, uh, and your uh, workplace might demand you uh, wear a monitor that tracks your temperature or other vital signs, just like my uh, Fitbit that I just got these days <laughs> to monitor my steps. Um, uh, where nightclubs ask, for uh, a, you know, they will ask you for ID to see if you're eligible to get into the nightclub. In the future, they might ask for proof of immunity. You know, nightclub as a, as hot spot for for the pandemic. Uh, they may ask you for proof of immunity, like uh, an, an identity card or some kind of digital verification via your phone, showing you've already recovered from or being vaccinated against the latest virus strains. We will adapt to and accept such measures, much as we've adapted to increasingly stringent airport security screening in the wake of the terrorist act uh, attack, referring to 9-11. This intrusive, this intrusive surveillance will be considered a small price to pay for the basic freedom to be with other people. End of quote. I just want to add one short thing. I don't know if you know that. In the US, I heard Dr. Fauci yesterday in NPR 
saying that close, almost, I don't know if more or less, but about 50% of Americans are against vaccine. Imagine tomorrow there is a good vaccine and still the American doesn't want to have it. So how are you going to have a society where you have vaccine, but some people resist to have it and you cannot force them? So how can I go to, to your work? Some have it, some don't have it. And that complicates all the, the meaning of uh, uh, like civil uh, uh, disobedience, like, uh, like almost like someone have tra- they want to have traffic light. He said, I'm free. I, want to use, I don't want to stop in traffic light. Or I don't want to use timing belt because I'm free and don't want to use it. The same thing. There's like a, a, all this polarization. 50% don't want to use the, the, the vaccine because they told them there is a chip they're going to put in your skin. They're going to do this. They can control you. And people seriously believe that. So that's one other dimension. You can think about whatever strategy you have. But if the society is left behind and they're not, they don't trust the system anymore, and it gets got stuck. I mean, the, whatever you do, even if you develop billion-dollar medication, People are not going to take it. Well, I mean, after 9-11, Mohammed, uh, when they put the measure, the 9-11 security measures, no choice for anybody. If you want to fly, you have to go through security. Otherwise, you drive or you walk or do something, right? The government has the capacity and the ability to force things when it comes to, uh, uh, even in the U.S., um, they, they can force things and they've been forcing things. Uh, by the way, I actually question that 50% of the population in the U.S. Uh, objects to. This number is not accurate. I've actually studied this issue. Um, unless, unless since the time I've studied, a huge number of denier have uh, come. But the anti-vaxxer are very tiny. In, in practice, I'm not talking about the rhetoric. People talk. But when it comes to when they know that uh, the solution is the vaccine for COVID-19, they're going to line up to get their vaccine. Um, I mean, I mean, if, I, if it was not Dr. Fauci, the head of uh, infectious disease in the U.S., saying this or agree on that, I will not say it. But myself, I would I, I was surprised to hear that. I listened to him this week, maybe not. In, I'm not sure which program. It was yesterday, was it yesterday that I invited him to, to NPR and he was saying that. Yeah, this week I heard him talking about it, but he did not put a number to it. He said a big number. By the way, even if it's a Fauci, because this is not a this uh, he's he's referring to the phenomena, which is different than when he's talking about um, the scientific data and the medical data on on uh, uh, on transfer of of virus and all that. Uh, I, I think there is it's legitimate for us to check that this is huge number to say fifty percent. Fifty percent that's hundred and fifty million people. Can you imagine that? I would. No, you cannot, no, you cannot say that because I'm, they have to talk about like uh, people like maybe 15, 16 years old and uh, and, high, and maybe um, maybe 70 or 75. That those who can be like really think and can discuss and agree to do things. But like, majority of people under 18, they're under their parents and it's made some, made their parent decision. But I, it's not him that said that. The journalist said it, said it, and the, he he didn't like reject it. So. I, I, he said yes, and he started talking about it. That means there's some numbers there to prove to. No, we, we, we hear Hadith Sahih, but you listen to the meaning and it just break your head. You say, uh, how can this be Sahih? Well, 150 million people of the US, which is 50%, denying vaccine, I would not accept that. I don't think anybody in the common sense would accept that. That that's hundred million fifty. Yasir, could you actually speak on your point? I mean, I, I don't really have anything to say that I didn't already write down. Yeah, just read for us because people are not reading the, the, the chat. Right, sure. So I was just commenting on the, um, the analogy that the writer in the excerpts that you took from the uh, was it an MIT review article or something. So it just troubled me that the the writer connects their um, hypothetical scenario for the future to airport security. Um, Because who who, is he speaking for when he says, oh, just as we've embraced airport security for the the better. I mean, I think he should speak for himself there because not all are okay with that. Right? So because to, to... but we've been traveling, uh, Yasin. We've been traveling. We didn't. We didn't express uh, uh, in 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 a practical way our objection by not by defying the measure. You you traveled, and many times, right? So in a sense, we accepted that pride of uh, infringing in our privacy in our pocket, 
for access to the travel convenience that doesn't mean we agree that doesn't mean we're that doesn't mean to to comply with uh, what we have to do to travel doesn't mean that we're accepting it right so i was saying so just the way he makes that analogy is so nonchalantly um, I take issue with that because to embrace um, embracing the straight the state surveillance apparatus in that uncritical of a tone is problematic. Um, because if we're not careful, we're just asking for the introduction of of more extremely problematic le legislation, out of the Patriot Act and similar um, legislation. S stopping pandemics is good. Um, take using technology to it to into for to, for the, to that um, for that effort is good. But we mustn't forget that the state is always going to hop on the opportunity to expand its surveillance apparatus um, for its own um, for its own you know malicious intent to crush dissents and so forth. So that's why I'm troubled by the tone of the writer in that excerpt. Yeah, and and, and of course uh, we have to keep uh, be mindful of uh, the the liberties and all those things. And 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 uh, keep talking about them, but 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 uh, by the way, this article I I I, just, I took an excerpt of the article. The next paragraph, he's talking about health dispar health health disparities and how the poorest of the community uh, get the worst of the this. So I don't think he was promoting this. He was just saying, imagining the future. The context here, he was imagining the future, because by the way, it's happening in in China from the get go. It's happening in South Korea. That's how China and South Korea were able to get control over the pandemic and, and, and come back to some uh, business normalcy, if you want to uh, talk about any normalcy. They did that. I know somebody who uh, was interviewed, a Moroccan working in the healthcare, uh, in vaccine in, in South Korea. And every time he leaves his office or come back in the office, they were always masked and they were always monitored the for temperature and in, in in china as you know they uh, they have vice monitoring the drone on the road to see where you went and where you came back and so it's not uh, uh, something that did not happen yet it's happening not uh we're just talking about west yes that, that's what i'm doing speaking in our context over here uh, yes actually i wanted to talk about the two the two points one um the one um by uh, uh, Muhammad about the, um, the statistics and the 50% or the 60% and, and really with the statistical numbers, I mean, I cannot, cannot be sure about what, what they mean unless you actually have a look at the whole report. You know, with, with statistical numbers, it's, it's based on, you know, the size um, of the group and where they're located and all of that. So it could be in one location in the States that, you know, they have um, tendency not uh, not to, to believe in, in the vaccine or any vaccination, and, and but that does not mean that the whole the whole country is like that. Um, that's that's one point. The other point is the um, the ex ex uh, the um, the talk from the MIT uh, guy. Actually, it's 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 further than this. I mean, this is easy to implement. Our phones record. Or register our our location all all the time. It's it's easy really to um, to get that from our our cell phones that we are all using, or at least ninety nine percent of of the people use use cell phones in which it will show the location and where they are. So tying this to infected areas or areas of concern is is easy, and I think that's. The um, the app that the Alberta government had had released is is doing something like this, not necessarily reporting it back. Now, in in China, for example, it, it even goes further than this, and and there is a a, a program, a voluntary program that people um, can can be on it, where actually they they record like social activities of of the people, so you get grades or. Um, on on with social activities that we get on the on the credit, so basically you get a social rating in which you know that will help you and progress in your um, job. For example, so you can get promoted faster because you're you're behaving uh, better than than us. And based on in, in this in this program, by sure. Yeah, your internet is spotty, Yeah, yeah, yeah. just spotty. Go ahead. Yeah, just just the final one. So so it's a 30 million people program that actually is there, where you know you get a social 
um, rating of, of your activities that would help you in getting loans or getting, you know, um, advanced in your, in your job and stuff like this. And based on this, actually, there was a, a TV show, Black Terror, which was based completely on that idea and how in the future this, this can control um, all, um, all lives. Uh, I was just looking up uh, uh, the uh, this question about uh, percents of American um, uh, uh, a Washington Post survey showed that 27% would likely refuse a vaccine and this is was uh, this was published on the Guardian uh, issue of uh, 3 days ago, on the 29th of June uh, Mustafa Qandouz uh, you want to comment there I did share a paper from Science magazine Talking about 50%. I don't know if you saw it. I just sent it now. 50% only are willing to have vaccine. Uh, is, was this a survey? Uh, and I just, I don't know if it's a survey, but I just uh, found it on the science uh, and the magazine, and I uh, said that 50% are only ready to get vaccine. Let's how to, to get the rest uh, to have it too. So basically, they are only 50% are confident to have it. You need to convince them. I guess that that's fifty percent of the sample, as Baha said, that they surveyed, right? So if they surveyed, I don't know, twenty thousand people and fifty percent, it's it's usually if the power calculation is there, then. But I just I just cannot accept my head cannot accept that in reality, you know, they may have re responded that way, but in reality, if tomorrow we have a vaccine, Trump will line up. Uh, Prince, uh, Pence would line up, all of them will line up to get the, the vaccine first and they get the best one, the most beautiful one, as you would say. <laughs> uh, any, uh, any other discussion and comment? I think uh, we are uh, uh, at a good time. We can, we can go on for a few, for, few more minutes, um, four or five minutes. Uh, any other discussion on the future of Maqasid? Also, I would uh, we would love to hear uh, um, maybe in the last few minutes uh, what was your experience um, uh, in the course um, for the session that you were able to attend. I mean, one of the difficulties I noticed is that people who came late or who uh, were not able to attend the most of the sessions did not get an idea um, on what's going on because we've we've said the vision and the mission on the first session. Uh, and it's uh, available on the YouTube. Um, and uh, I know Brother Mustafa Abdelouhab, Dr. Mustafa Abdelouhab, Abdelouhab, um, always asking, why are you guys talking about Maqasid when the word have done this and that, and you are still talking about Abu Han Ibn Hanbal and this and that. Uh, uh, and I, I had private conversation with him. I said, Mustafa, uh, if you want to have uh, another session about innovation or about business or about capital, we could do that. But this theory was about maqasid and how we could apply maqasid to understand the pandemic. And that's what we're doing. I, I mean, judge, judge if we deviate from that and let us stay with that. And, uh, but, but um, you know, knowing Mustafa, he loves to, um, to get the community into opportunities. He sees that this forum is really wasting time where we could actually be capitalizing on some opportunities out there. Uh, but we have to have the discipline if we say that we're doing something, we should be, I mean, we're, 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 we don't think we actually um, um, achieved all the goals, but, uh, but alhamdulillah, we've, uh, we've tried something. And uh, uh, I personally benefited a lot. Uh, I felt um, that um, it, was, it was a lot of uh, learning happening, a lot of, uh, from both aspects, from the Maqasid perspective, it was a good review for me because I've also sat on the 2014 uh, series. Um, the other thing, when, it, when uh, personally, uh, when, it, when we say that, oh, the COVID-19 is depriving us from the interaction, I find in my life, there is a lot more interaction with the new Zoom opportunities and webinars than ever before. I mean, I am fatigued because in the past, you have to make an appointment, physical appointment to, to have somebody talk to you. You talk to them, you have to fly them. Now, they just call you or you call them. And, and uh, at work also, I am exhausted with the amount of meetings we have now on Zoom, Zoom after Zoom, Zoom after Zoom, and you have to jump from meeting to meeting. In the past, they, they had to book a room <laughs> to have a meeting. 
and and we had a limited number of rooms so you have to choose your day in the week when to have the meeting now that's not an issue so i don't think personally personally i don't think that um, these uh, opportunities that we that we acquired during covid 19 of of c connections are less they're actually better uh, i mean we have in global uh, global interaction with scientists and with students uh, Bourdie and I this morning we were uh, participating in a conference uh, uh, where we uh, have uh, you know working with the people in the third world country trying to help uh, trying to support trying to guide trying to benefit and learn and, and collaborate anybody wanted to uh, speak personally how they felt uh... yes um I, I really would like to thank you and um, all the brother the brothers that that worked on on this um, on this course. Um, it was valuable. It is valuable, and it's uh, beneficial. I it's really appreciated. Um, I, I like the format. It made us uh, easy to connect and um, and to um, to get this uh, this course. Um, I appreciate that we had people from UK, from Morocco, from Toronto, Alberta, like, like it, it, it brought this experience of people from different locations um, to this uh, to this course or these these sessions. So, in 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 all respect, um, I really thank you and and the team, uh, Muhammad and uh, Hisham and and brothers and that that worked on this. It's um, it's really appreciated and thank you for that. I mean, now that you are um, you're thanking the the participant, I, I omitted to mention Imam Juhari Abdul Malik. He made a, a very sizable contribution, uh, presenting to us on the f five necessities and application on the slavery. Um, uh, Brother Omar Ewen, he's been a faithful participant in this series, uh, nonstop. Uh, I know he's usually quiet, but uh, he's been there all along. And of course, Hamza from his from from the UN household and Nora from the UN household, that also were tagging along with us in this series, uh, and they actually paid back by um, inviting me to their own series on design thinking, designing your life. So now I have a session with them every Sunday on uh, working on the process of designing your life. Um, Mustafa Kanduz, uh, your personal uh, perspective on this series. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why you put my name on there because I, I really didn't contribute other than the occasional um, picky comments I made. <laughs> um, but um, I really uh, have um, the utmost, utmost respect for people who, who think. Uh, you might not always be um, uh, getting where you want to, but at least you're trying and I think uh, you, your series here is is very important and uh, is um, looking at something that uh, that's uh, um, overlooked by uh, by most so and uh, I, I really learned a lot I, I didn't understand everything obviously because it's not really my field and my background in the field is very uh, limited but um, it certainly has opened my eyes to certain important questions. So I, I, in that regard, I really appreciate and I thank you a lot, uh, all the contributors. No, thank you. Um, we really appreciated your um, regular uh, interventions there. Um, I think they were thoughtful. And uh, at, uh, in early phases of your uh, uh, participation. Uh, um, I think we th there was a feeling from your side that you're bothering us, and in, in the contrary, we never bothered by your comment. You were, they were all thoughtful. They were all good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thank you. Uh, um, it's just that I'm in a in a, a, a very critical mode right now. I, I uh, uh, apart from this series in in my uh, intellectual life, I criticize a, a, a lot of stuff. So. Um, uh, that can sometimes be annoying. I, I'm not always like that, but um, but um, seriously, I I think one thing that regarding regarding this um, future of the field, I think 
you guys, if you're pursuing in this uh, project, I think you could really use um, knowledge from other um, uh, other fields, you know, methodological or conceptual uh, input from other fields might strengthen even more your your uh, your endeavor. So. Um, uh, I, I, I personally like to look into philosophy or cognitive sciences and all, all kinds of sciences. They always all have something to add, uh, an idea that you could apply or you could, uh, that can direct you into your own, um, within your own framework to think about specific questions. So uh, I know you're already be, do, doing that, but, uh, um, just a reminder, if I if I may. As uh, Mohammed Biliam Burdi, Mohammed Burdi, I know you didn't start from the beginning with us, but uh, you you should have a, a good idea of this series. What do you think? I, yeah, probably I participate twenty percent, but uh, I think what this topic or this series will bring is that, uh, like you said, this coronavirus have brought us some positive thing, which is to get people together. And this is especially very critical for those who live in the U.S. and Canada because we have a huge country and we are not too many and they are very dispersed in all the their places and very hard to gather people. Now with this technology, I have been, uh, myself, I have been interested to it like maybe 10 years ago when they just started before even Zoom. And I was thinking, wow, this could be, because I used to go to Morocco, organize workshops there. And it's costly and very hard to, to fly there. And it's a lot of uh, expenses for the hotel. I was saying, this is a good opportunity. You can select any topic, invite the top on the people in the, in the field and invite them and they'd be nice to give a presentation. And then this way you can, you can have a nice talk and learn from it. And uh, beside now, this is special series have uh, out of the, the thinking. I mean, the way is not like as scientists, we usually uh, listen or discuss things in our field, but here gets you something a little bit different, which used to be in the past, this, uh, the Hukama used to be a, a medical doctor and a philosopher and thinker and, uh, uh, and poet, like uh, uh, someone that have different field of expertise. And here we are, each one in a speciality. But this kind of topic and at the same time using the Zoom, I mean, can do a lot of things by bringing people far away from each other and from different countries, from different continents. And even bring in not only like uh, Muslims, sometimes you can bring non-Muslim and they're going to be expert and they, they can teach you a lot of things that probably never thought about it. And that's what this uh, series can also teach us is, I mean, it, we are not limited to any topic. You can be using any topic, make a series of it and uh, have uh, people get together and discuss. Now, because of this, I, I, I know new faces that I probably I would never have saw them if it was not this topic, so different places from Canada, from Europe, and from Morocco, even from the U.S. So I think that's a, uh, that's a good thing, and it's uh, give you as a, uh, make you like a, some supportive thinking. That's that is the way to go, and we have to uh, maybe uh, look at out of the box and just not especially think all the time with our field, but look at other uh, field that are far away from science and to see how they can, we can learn from that. I was wondering, from uh, the youth uh, perspective, Yasin, uh, was this um, series uh, helpful? Um, is this something that you felt uh, worth the time? I, I appreciated um, how it was, um, uh, how we applied Naqasid uh, Sharia to um, a contemporary issue. I think that's the way to go when it comes to uh, the Dean in general. You know, keep keeping it fresh keeping it relevant um so that you know um non-scholars non ulama can see why this stuff is important that's, a, that's actually an important uh, point because when we started the maqasid uh, in the first day we said that maqasid is not um, just for the specialist but as dr ahmed raisuni said um fiqh al qurb that we have to break it down at different levels. So the scholars uh, approach it a certain way, the student of knowledge approach it a certain way, and the lay people, which is all of us, approach it also. Just like we approach Quran without having a certificate to read Quran, everybody can read Quran, everybody can think and read about Maqasid. Uh, Hisham. 
uh, uh, salam alaikum. For me, it, it was the second journey of Maqasid. And I, I believe I was slacker a little bit because I slacked a couple, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, you work on all stuff. But uh, I, I, I believe today I can, I can, I can, uh, I can pretend that I uh, uh, have a little bit more clarity in this maqasid uh, field as a lay, a lay person, uh, uh, you know, uh, because when we did it in 2014, uh, we learned, you know, it was, it was a new, fresh learning. But I believe today I, I, I will say that, um, uh, and this approach that Yassin talked about is the first time we, we apply something from from religious perspective to something that is complicated and it's we live it every every single day. We used to have this, uh, you know, we're talking about historical models, we're talking about historical figures, we're talking about, but uh, for the first time, I believe, and I think it was a very good experience to practice something on the field, on, on, on the day-to-day on -day life, that you're living it right now, and this is not something historical, you're living it yourself. But I think it was, uh, I think it was, uh, a very good experience and uh, the second experience uh, you know this this um, second um, shot at the maqasid it gave me a more uh, more clearer idea about maqasid and i think a more uh, deeper understanding i think uh, and i it was it was a good journey you know, sometimes is you, you have to struggle you have to uh, you know juggling with work juggling with family juggling with all stuff to attend but I believe attended was always rewarding, rewarding all the time. Alhamdulillah. Hajja, um, can you uh, say, uh, you, I know you've been sitting there the whole series, listening and taking it in. Uh, you are part of the committee that put together this series. Uh, any personal uh, comment? So for me, it's, uh, uh, I'm teaching Islamic studies and uh, studying uh, the maqasid the sharia and understand it give me a different uh, a deeper understanding of the religion itself and it changed even my perspective in the way i'm teaching my students and the way like i make even like some decision in my life and dealing with other people because when you have a clear view what is important and what is not important and how to prioritize things in your life, in your dealing with others. And so it's, it changed completely how you are looking at so many things. And so that was my, uh, uh, my what I learned like with my dealing in about the Maqasid Sharia and having the understanding about it. Well, we leave uh, the best for the last, Muhammad bin Yemeni. Uh, I, I, will, I will pick you after me. <laughs> so you will be the best. I will pick myself, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the consideration. Every second you put me, this is uh, who does that and who does and that. It's not true 100%, just to make it clear. <laughs> They do credit. You have to. Yeah, yeah. and um, for for me, it was um, it was a good journey because I was uh, kind of fully invested into it. And uh, when you get into something and you are fully invested into it, you 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 get yourself you get out of it different. Um, before that, if you pick my mind and you ask me. Uh, maybe about the maqasid and maybe about the particularity of the, the, the limitation that we are taking. Uh, it was not there, just and we are learning. We are learning from interventions. We are, if we keep speaking to ourselves, we not learn anything. But because we are coming and we are sharing and we are hearing critics and we are hearing kind of comments and we are hearing and you get invested into it, and even uh, Brother Nordin, I will put him in spot right now, uh, keep bringing uh, positive and negative comments from his network because he's broadcasting whatever is happening and he's gathering the data from, from, from whatever. And sometimes you feel offended, sometimes you feel 
it's not worth it, but sometimes you feel, no, let's keep it. Let's just keep the focus. I don't want to get to get distracted again. And uh, that was kind of a journey. It's like it, was, it wasn't that, um, and it's not the first time. Every, every time we pick a session and we are going through 12 weeks, we find ourselves into it and juggling between that and that and work and family and Ramadan and so on. All that stuff it was happening. And at the same time, juggling emotionally with type of the feedback you are getting. And it was kind of teaching for me. It was kind of getting getting to the level to deal with it and to move on and to 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 keep trying and to keep trying pushing in the way you see you you see should be i mean sometimes you get based on the comments and uh, uh, that oh maybe we need to change no we don't want to change we have strategy we have a goal let's keep focus and, and move on and it happened not only to me i was speaking to myself when when it happened i'm telling that to 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 to, to senor dean so um uh, and thank you for the people that they commented in the session or they commented after the session or they commented between Nordin and themselves. All that stuff happened to come to me. <laughs> and I was learning from it. And thank you, everybody. It's like I, my learning was coming from people. And my learning was coming from the struggle I'm getting from the session and my uncomfortable way to deal with that ideas uh, and struggling with myself and struggling from what is coming. It's 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 double double struggle, um, and uh, I don't want to lose. Uh, it's like you have something that you were um, you, you you were building a lot on it. Oh my God! If only people get it, they will be more faithful. Now, like I will really doubt that. I will I will doubt that. Just just as conclusion, it's not that way. It's not that easy. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's not maybe the right framework. That's that's the conclusion that we got in Tuesday, and I'm still I'm still promoting it. And I'm, it's part of my journey, anyways. And uh, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Senor Dean, for your patience to me. And um, I'm a little bit sometimes uh, painful, but um, I'm trying my best to be kind. I mean. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you, Brother uh, Mustafa. Mustafa Kandouz, I learned a lot from your comments and critics and, uh, and, uh, and picky notes, as you said. It's like it's, 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 self, it's self contemplation. It's more than dealing with something from outside. And um, uh, really appreciate, really appreciate the journey and going all together in this journey and uh, getting out of it, maybe different people. That's what. Uh, that's what makes my experience. Thank you. Zakumah and everybody, um, uh, I really appreciate and thank everybody that attended, those who are with us today and those who didn't make it today. Uh, the hermetic uh, brother Mustafa Abdullahad, and uh, I had to represent him because he's not here. That uh, that's the dimension that he loves to talk about, and he was very uh, lively um, participant. Uh, actually, during the session and post session, I have many exchange with him where he uh, uh, emphasized uh, his, his ideas. Um, um, with that, uh, I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this work uh, for his own sake. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, nishhadu illa ila illa anta nistaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Subhanahu wa rabbika, bilizdam, masifun, salam, wa nusayim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam, jazakum Allah khairan. I hope you can take, uh, keep in touch, inshallah. Inshallah. You can get my email from Sinor Dean if in case you're interested. I will, I will. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> I will be the first one who will be getting it. It's, it's always good to uh, meet uh, thoughtful people. Thank you. Thank you. Barak Allah Fik. Same here. Barak Allah Fik. Salam Nice to see your face. <laughs> oh, yeah, I haven't seen it before. Oh, the only reason goodness. I do that is because. Uh, the connection becomes, uh, uh, sh sh you know, shaky yeah. when I, uh, uh, surfing. <laughs> 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 <laughs>